Hello and welcome to Total Health with Dr. Nick, where if you're new to my channel, my purpose is to inspire, empower, and motivate you to live longer, healthier, and more abundant lives. And today I want to talk to you about what the real truth is about gluten. Everybody is all worried about this. What is the whole deal about this? You know, you're going to parties, you're going to events, and you're thinking, I don't know if I can eat what's there because I hear gluten's a bad thing. I hear gluten is a time bomb. I hear people just get sick on gluten. You might be gluten sensitive. You might have celiac. What is the real truth about this? And why is it all of a sudden, something that's been around for hundreds if not thousands of years, why is this all of a sudden such a big deal? What has changed with gluten? What's going wrong with this? And I'll tell you, if you really want to know, make sure you watch to the end, because I'm going to tell you exactly what the real problem is with gluten. But guys, if you like what we're talking about, make sure you like, share, comment, and subscribe. Make sure you click that little bell notification so that you get notified every single time I make a video. And guys, if you're looking to get more help with the keto diet and you're thinking, I'd really love to get into the best shape of my life. I've heard so much about keto, how beneficial it is. My friends are doing it, but you know what? It seems overwhelming. I don't know what to do. Then guys, check out my keto course. We make it so easy for you. We tell you step by step what to do, what to eat, when to eat it, when to do intermittent fasting where to shop, what to shop for. If you're out at restaurants, what you can eat at different food chains, we give it all to you. We've got inspiration in there, motivation, movies, videos to keep you moving along. It is by far the best program out there on the market. So check it out, see if it's a fit for you. Like I said, in the link right below, you can click on that and you can get started today. Anyway, guys, once again, let's dive into this because I tell you what, Gluten is probably one of the biggest problems we see today. People are going to restaurants, they're going to parties, they're going out thinking, I don't know what I can eat. This is like a ticking time bomb, but I'm gonna tell you all the information. So like I said, watch to the end and you get all the information you need. What is gluten? Well, gluten is really a protein. It's a protein made of a lot of different proteins, but it's really made of two primarily, and that is gliadin or gliadin, whatever you wanna pronounce it, and glutenin. This one here, gliadin, is the one that helps the bread rise, and glutenin is the one that gives it its elasticity. So when you see guys in the pizzerias and they're throwing up that dough and they're expanding it and expanding it and opening it up and they're throwing it and it just seems like this thing is like rubber, that is the glutenin in it. So that is the, probably the bigger problem of the two is this protein that gives it its elasticity. So where does this whole problem come from? How has this evolved? Because as far as I know, my mother never had issues with gluten. My grandmother never had issues with gluten. Your problem is that the gluten we're using today is not the same gluten that our ancestors used. Now, I don't mean thousands of years ago. I mean 50 to 100 years ago. This has really, really changed a lot. See, gluten has become hybridized over 25,000 times since its origin. The first type of wheat was actually called einkorn wheat, and that was way, way back before biblical times, that wheat was then crossbred with another kind of wild wheatgrass to make emmer wheat. Now, emmer wheat is really more of the biblical type of wheat. So this wheat has gone through different transformations. Einkorn wheat had about 14 chromosomes. The wheat of today's got like 42 chromosomes. So it's almost like Franken food. It's not even the same thing. Imagine if we went from the chromosomes we have, 46, to all of a sudden 90. We would have two heads and six arms and things like that. So to think that the same wheat that was used by our ancestors is the same wheat that is today, it is far from it, not even close. And that's the problem. Our body doesn't know what to do with it, how to process it. It is way too foreign because of all the over-hybridization. The wheat we think about when you're hearing America the Beautiful and all these songs where you're seeing wheat blowing in the wind and so on, you're thinking it's four or five foot wheat and it's blowing in the, you know, in the, in the hills and the harvest land and all the Midwest and all that, and it's just this beautiful wheat. Well, it's not that kind of wheat anymore. Wheat had to be hybridized to make it more drought resistant, heat resistant, and also too, so it can grow more berries. See, wheat is called a berry. That's what it is. It's like almost like a, a piece of rice, except in wheat, it's called a berry. Well, if they want to get a bigger harvest and more berries, you can't have four foot stalks because the four foot stalks break off. So you have to start to grow the wheat shorter. Now, today's wheat is called dwarf wheat, and it's about as high as your kneecap. That's about it. It's about 18 inches tall, so it's not the same wheat. You wouldn't even recognize it anymore because it also takes less for the nitrogen and other chemicals to get up into the berries if it's got 
you know, a shorter stock. Shorter stock, the, the, the nutrients can get there quicker, the chemicals they're using. So one, it helps with drought resistant, heat resistant, helps the nutrients get there faster, and it helps the stalks from breaking to have this now dwarf wheat. Well, here's the problem. So when they broke wheat down in the chemical laboratory and they put it under different enzymes, it actually broke down into something called an exorphin. An exorphin means exogenous morphine, meaning a morphine from outside the body. See, an endorphin is the morphine that you get from inside your body. That's what your brain makes. An exogenous morphine or an exorphin is what comes from outside the body. What then happened is they named it gluteal morphine. Now, gluteal morphine means that it's a gluten type of morphine. Here's the problem. This binds to the same receptor sites in your brain as opium and heroin do. And how they found this out was when people would go to the hospital suffering some type of um, reaction because they were strung out on different drugs, heroin, opium, whatever it may be. They gave them a drug called naloxone. And when they gave them naloxone, it actually broke that connection between their brain and the drug in a way so that they weren't having that same kind of high. They came off the high. Well, what they found was when they gave that same drug, naloxone, to people in a study that were, you know, eating different types of bread and so on, they found that they ate 30% less bread. So they found that, hey, they didn't get the same high, they didn't eat the same amount of bread, less calories, they didn't get high from the bread. See, many times people will tell me, my patients and different people I talk to, say, Dr. Nick, you know what, I don't have a problem with sweets. My sweets aren't an issue. I don't get into the cakes and the cookies and the pies and the pastries. My problem is, I can't give up the bread. The bread's like a high and you know it. You see that. You maybe start to eat bread and you start to feel good. Next thing you know, you're eating a muffin and you're feeling good. You start to crash during the course of the day and you're looking for another muffin or something. You're looking for something else with that wheat type of component because now you know it binds to the same receptor sites in your brain as heroin and opium do. So this is a high that you get. That's one of the reasons why you have to break your gluten addiction. If it's not just for the simple fact that it tears your insides up, your intestines, it's because it creates such a high that your body then starts to revolve around your eating habits for the day. You start to look for that next time when you're gonna get some bread or next time you're gonna have some coffee and a muffin. It really becomes so, so addictive. Now, different symptoms come with gluten sensitivity and I could tell you that people have different sensitivities to this. Some people just get a little irritated, a little bit bloated. Some people, like my daughter, start to get really full-blown stomach pain where she's doubled over or she's not feeling good all day long. Other people are really, they get brain fog, they get all kinds of symptomatology because maybe they're more than gluten sensitive, they have celiac disease. Now if you have celiac or Crohn's or ulcerative colitis and you're using this, that's really, really bad. That's like DEFCON 5 for patients like that. So some of the different things you might see brain-wise, irritability, brain fog, mood swings. Like I said, you start to notice that you, you're eating wheat. And here's the problem, you won't even notice it until you stop eating the wheat. You get off of wheat for a week and you go, wow, I can't believe my, my brain is clear. I don't have the, the crashes like I do. I don't have the moodiness. I'm not chewing my spouse's head off or my boss's head off. I can't believe it. I just feel so much better. My mind is clearer. I'm more alert. I'm sharper. And this is one of the benefits of, of how the keto diet works because wheat creates a lot of inflammation in the brain, whereas the keto diet, because you're using ketones and fats for fuel, it reduces the inflammation. Not only that, you see different ulcers and sores. Some of you experience that. You eat wheat, you start to notice little sores inside your mouth and so on. Uh, you see eczema, skin rashes. This is really common. Whenever I see patients come in my office and they're complaining about skin rashes or eczema or dermatitis, things like that, the first thing I say to them, I'm not worried about what kind of shampoo they're using or soap. I'm saying get off the wheat. I've had more patients come in with skin conditions that were helped by just getting off wheat products because it is so horrible, horrible for skin because of the inflammation. And like I said, our body doesn't know how to process it. Infertility, do you ever think menstrual problems and infertility could be coming from wheat issues? It can, absolutely. Joint swelling, that's a huge one. You know, when we talk about arthritis, that means swelling of a joint. Itis means inflammation of, and arthro means joint. When we think about that, we'd never think that, oh, I wonder if the wheat I'm taking or eating or the cookies or the crackers or the cakes I'm eating could be causing that. Well, I'm telling you, absolutely it is. I had one of my patients many years ago, his name was Ed, just one of the first cases I ever talked to about this. 
Whenever he came in, he'd be in tears because he'd say, Dr. Nick, I was in the barber chair today. I couldn't handle it. My, my joints were hurting so much. And I said, Ed, every time you eat chocolate cookies, chocolate chip cookies, you feel this way. It's the wheat. You need to get off the wheat. Then one day he finally figured it out. He came in, Dr. Nick, I think it's the wheat that's the problem. I'm like, that's really good. I'm amazed you figured it out all by yourself. But he's, you know, he, he finally figured it out and it changed and transformed his life. He was taking a drug called Remicade that was costing him $3,000 a month. And he was able to get off of that because arthritic conditions like rheumatoid arthritis are from inflammation. And inflammation can come from the wheat. So you get off the wheat, your joints are going to feel better. I promise you, try that. Joint swelling, pain, stiffness, burning in the joints, nausea, constipation. You know, this is all the intestinal stuff that goes along with it. You know you feel this. Like I said, my daughter experienced this is a lot. And I've been telling her for years now, stop eating so much wheat. But you know what? It's, she's a kid. You know, it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's in different fast food chains. You know, she wants to go out with her friends and she doesn't want to feel like she can't have what they're having. But then she pays the price for it dearly. So I remember right around Thanksgiving, I made a whole bunch of turkey stock and I made some soup. I had about five gallons of it and I was giving her turkey soup every day. And she had turkey soup for about a week. Her stomach felt great. Why? Because bone broth is fantastic for gut health, all right? So get off the wheat and start doing healthy stuff like the keto diet, a lot of probiotics, whether it be uh, different fermented foods. And, uh, and, and like I said, eat healthier fats. So what's the deal with celiac disease? What does it cause with that? Well. As you know, inside your intestines, you have these folds. And what those folds do is actually increases surface area. So just like in your lungs, you have your villi. Well, those, or alveoli, I should say, those increase surface area. So that way you have more area to breathe. Well, same thing here. These folds create more surface area so that way your body can absorb nutrients and get rid of waste and so on. But the problem is with celiac disease and the problem created by gliadin is that it causes blunting. So all these folds then get blunted down. And you could also start to get leaky gut syndrome. I did a video on that where I talked about the leaky gut and how the cells that are inside your intestines have these tight junctions. And things like glyphosate, Glyphosate, when they spray it on the crops and crop dust them, that causes all kinds of problems. So when you get glyphosate into your system, which by the way, all the crops today are what we call Roundup Ready. They have the Roundup already inside the seeds, so that way when they crop dust them, it doesn't kill the actual plants, but yet it's all in the food now. That can cause breaks in those tight junctures. And now you're getting food particles, you're getting waste, you're getting bacteria, all starting to come into the bloodstream and you get leaky gut from that. So like I said, with celiac disease, what they're saying is this, the lining of the intestine becomes permeable, allowing all kinds of dangerous chemicals to enter the bloodstream, such as toxins and bacteria. This tricks the body, causing an autoimmune response, attacking normal organs such as the thyroid and joints, leading to Hashimoto's thyroiditis and rheumatoid arthritis. So once again, when you start creating problems where it's like celiac disease, it creates autoimmune disorders. And many of you are experiencing that. Like I said, you start to notice whether you have Hashimoto's or you have eczema, dermatitis, things like that, all caused by problems coming from the inside out. You can't keep going to the doctors and getting lotions and creams put on that. It's not coming from the outside. You didn't brush up against something. It's coming from the inside out. So stop treating the symptoms, start healing your gut. And the way to heal a gut is to get off the wheat, get off the gluten. Now, this is what I was talking about before with the tight junctures. You start to get all these different toxins, food particles. These are your cells in the lining of your intestines. You have all this. This is all what's inside your intestines. And when you start to create problems with wheat and glyphosate and so on, these tight junctions start to open up and allow all these different drugs, pathogens, food particles, bacteria, yeast infections, all to go through and into your bloodstream. And once it's into your bloodstream, it starts to cause problems where it crosses the blood-brain barrier, it causes inflammation, autoimmune disorders, and next thing you know, you have malabsorption and nutrient deficiency issues. You start to lose weight. Even though you're eating so much, you're absolutely losing weight as a result of it. Not only that, wheat causes all kinds of other problems when it comes to putting fat on your body. Because here's the problem. 
It's not just about fat in different places like your thighs and your buttocks and things like that. This puts it around your visceral organs. This is visceral fat. So when you have problems where you eat a bagel, it increases your blood sugar. It increases then your insulin because your insulin goes up to be able to get that blood sugar put into the into the muscles, into the cells, into the liver, so that way it could be burned and utilized as fuel or stored. The problem is, is this, this wheat, wheat gets stored around the belly. Wheat is very specific. In fact, there's a book out there I highly recommend you read called Wheat Belly where it talks about this. Wheat is very different. Gluten is very different. It's not just about eating sugar like your table sugar where you're eating a Snickers bar or a candy bar. That puts it on your thighs or your buttocks, things like that, maybe under your arms. But wheat is very specific in that it puts it around the waist. When it puts it around the waist, now you're creating a hormonal imbalance because now you're causing a hormonal estrogenic problem. That's why guys, you'll start to get breasts. Ladies, you'll start to find that you're gaining weight around your waist that you have no control of anymore because now you start to get more fat cells there because of the wheat. It's going to start to create a lot more estrogen issues and that is a fact. Now, you get inflammatory issues. You also then get hormone disruption. And a lot of you ladies I know experience that. You get all this hormone disruption and it's coming from wheat. You've got to get off it. This is one of the many reasons why the ketogenic diet is such a great diet. It's such a great lifestyle because you're getting off of all this stuff that's highly inflammatory to your body. It causes leaky gut, brain fog, eczema, skin conditions, anything you can think of. What foods contain gluten? Well, Things like wheat, rye, and barley all contain gluten. This is what it's in. Here's the problem. It's in a lot of things you don't even realize it. So you're thinking, well, I'm not eating so much bread or I'm not eating cakes or pastries, but it could be in lipstick. It could be in tea bags. It could be in ketchup. It could be in dressings. It's in everything. So breads, pastries, pies, bagels, donuts, rolls, that's the obvious stuff, okay? We all know it's in that. We all know it's in crackers, cakes, pancakes, crouton stuffings, and flour tortillas. We know it's in those things, okay? That's the obvious stuff. The not so obvious stuff is sauces and gravies. Well, what do you think thickens it up? That's how they get these gravies thickened up. We see it in dressings. Did you know it could be in beer? It could be a beer, alcohol, lipstick, makeup, gum. When you're eating a piece of gum and you see that, that powdery substance on the outside that helps keep it sticking from the, to the wrapper, that's wheat. Things like tea bags. My wife came out to lunch with us one time. We were having a, an employee lunch, and all of a sudden she sits down and she starts getting dizzy because she drank tea at a friend's house, and a friend had tea bags, and what they do to keep the tea bags from sticking together and keep them nice and loose in the packets, they can have flour on them. So the wheat is everywhere. You don't realize where it is, and next thing you know, you're having a reaction to something, and you're not sure why. My wife got dizzy out of nowhere, and I was like, what did you eat? What did you have? She's like, I just had some tea. I said, honey, you know, it could be on a tea bag. So I'm not trying to make you paranoid, but just be aware that if you do have a reaction and you do feel bad, where it could be coming from and start to root out where you think gluten is hiding in your house that you're not even aware of. Who would have thought lipstick? Everybody knows crackers and bread and things like that, but lipstick, beer, alcohol? I'm like, you kidding me? Of course, if you want to drink vodka, have potato vodka. Use something like that if you want to have something like that. Anyway, so what are your gluten-free flours? Well, your amaranth flour, teff flour. Now, I don't use some of these, okay? But if you're on a keto diet, you can't really get into some of those, like your brown rice flour, white rice flour, and gluten-free oat flour. Now, these are the ones you want to use if you're on a keto diet, is your almond, hazelnut flour, peanut flour, and of course, coconut flour, stuff like that. So you have your coconut flour and your chickpea. These are your nut flours. These are all over here. So those are the ones I would recommend. Mainly your almond and your coconut flour, the two that I typically use the most. So guys, I hope, I hope you stay clear of gluten. And by the way, whether you have a gluten sensitivity or not, it's still not a great thing to be around very often. So limit your time with it. Limit your friendship with gluten. Limit your friendship with cakes. If you're going to have them from time to time, that's okay. Have it on a cheat day. But I'll tell you what, if you're sensitive to it, you don't get a cheat day. You're going to be doubled over in pain.
I've seen it happen to too many of my patients. So anyway, guys, I hope you liked the video. Make sure you like, share, comment, and subscribe. And by the way, before you go, don't you go anywhere. You check out my other videos because if you like this one, you're going to love these two. They're all full of great information. Guys, I love and appreciate you. This is Dr. Nick. I will see you on the next video. Bye-bye.